welcome everybody. I'm Marcy Stockman, and I'll be moderating this event on an epic demic in loneliness. I'd like to say that if we finish early, there will be time for questions. So keep that in mind, and they'll come around with microphones. Uh, to my left here is Dr. Carrie Cronin. She is Associate Director of the Lonergan Institute in Boston College and Faculty Fellow of the Center for Student Formation. For the past 20 years, she has taught in the Boston College Interdisciplinary Perspectives Program, a philosophy and theology program in the Great Books tradition. Additionally, she works extensively with undergraduates in retreat programs at Boston College and is a regular speaker on college campuses addressing topics of student culture and formation. Carrie is also known for her decade-long studies in the area of human affectivity and dating. And Emily Esfahani Smith is a journalist and the author of The Power of Meaning, Finding Fulfillment in a World Obsessed with Happiness. She is also an editor at the Manhattan Institute. Her articles and essays have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, The Atlantic, The New Criterion, and other publications. She delivered a talk on the main stage of TED Talks in 2017 called There's More to Life Than Being Happy. Smith was born in Switzerland and grew up in Montreal, and currently she lives in Washington, DC. Today we are experiencing what many call an epidemic in loneliness. And I imagine this topic relates to everybody here we recognize a new kind of loneliness in our culture. Last year, I attended three funerals where the cause of death was suicide. This is a tragic increase. Something is happening in our culture. There's a growing inability to establish fulfilling relationships, and I think we all sense this. One aspect of this inability is played out in the progressive decline of dating in our culture. It's, it's confusing. What is dating now? How, how, do, how do people, young people go about this process? And so that's why I think a lot of you are probably really interested in being here, because it's an issue that mm -hmm. these topics relate to all of us. So Carrie, you started the dating project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the dating project, what is it's that? sort of nutty. <laughs> how did this come about? What did you see in the lives of your students at Boston College and in the culture that brought about the Dating Project. What is it? Sure, so, hi everybody. It's so great to be here. Um, right, so about, oh gosh, it had to be about 17 or 18 years ago, I had a great conversation with a, a group of Boston College seniors, and it was just a, a, a small group of, of students, and I was just, we were just talking about life, and life after graduation, and that sort of thing, and, and, I stumbled into the question of dating. I said, well, what are you gonna do when you graduate? You know, you're gonna break up with people you've been dating or what's gonna happen? And they all sort of <laughs> looked at me like I was speaking Greek. And, and I don't know how to speak Greek. And I said, uh, <laughs> you know those people you're dating? And, and what these students said to me was, oh no, we don't, we don't date anymore, we just, we don't know how to do that, that's, that's crazy. Um, but hook up, hooking up is great and that kind of thing. So I started asking students about it quite a bit and around campus I would just run into people and start asking them about dating and hooking up and I got too much information. <laughs> <laughs> In a lot of cases that was kind of scary. But um, <laughs> so then I, uh, uh, maybe a semester or two after that I started asking a, a class of seniors in a capstone class that I was teaching to go on a date, to ask somebody out in person and go on a date. And I thought that was an easy assignment, but uh, <laughs> I discovered that it wasn't. And in that first semester, it, it, it took them months. And, and most of them didn't even, weren't even able to complete the assignment. And so after that, I made it a mandatory assignment. I used to say to students, I'll flunk you in this class if you don't ask somebody out, which I, I, I don't know. That was, <laughs> did it was you, a little shady, did but... Your class size go up? Right now. <laughs> right. I, well, the, you know, the first, uh, I, I announced it because 
I'm fair and didn't want to get fired, that, um, that I announced it during the drop ad period. And so a bunch of students immediately left the class. <laughs> and, but, but then other students came in and it filled up. And, uh, and then it got to the point where I had I have students regularly. I just had a student say this to me the other day. I'm taking your class so that you will make me go on a date. And I thought, <laughs> or you could just ask somebody on a date. I don't know, but okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of homework to do otherwise, but uh, okay. So, um, so anyway, it just it sort of kind of became a thing. And, and I give talks about it now and everything. But, but to, to the question, uh, I'm going on and on. To the question, what I saw was something that struck me as an important question, what's going on, but then really quickly got connected to my noticing and other faculty noticing that, that the levels of depression and anxiety that we're seeing in our college students today is just off the charts, and it's really frightening. And, and I started to make those kinds of connections. So over the last 10 years, you've seen an increasing distance with sure. the students. Yeah. Can you describe this distance and what possibility do you see for overcoming this distance? Oh my gosh, such easy questions. Um, <laughs> well, you know, the distance, to, to, to the distance question generally, I would say, you know, we all know, when I, what I see with college students is we all know that they're so uber connected on social media, right? They, they're, they're constantly, you know, connecting to, to people. And, and, yet, and yet you feel that, the, that they don't really have any very deep connections or that they struggle with deep connections. They want them, but they don't know how to go about it. And I remember I, had, I, I was talking to a young man um, who had been in my class, and he came by to talk to me about something, and he said, I just had my 21st birthday the other day. And I said, oh, that's great. Congratulations. Happy birthday. And he said, yes. it was." Great, I went out with 32 of my closest friends. <laughs> and I said, did you say 32? <laughs> and he said, yes. And I said, y uh, you don't know what the word closest means, right? And, and when I started talking to him about those friendships and those relationships, I realized there was almost the social equivalent of like a fist bump, right? Like, <laughs> like you just sort of like, hey, 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 and then nothing, and then hey, 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 hey. You know, there's a lot of, of that kind of hmm. communication. So I think, and, and what I hear from, from students, college students across the, across the country when I go to speak, is this sort of what I, what I might characterize as a, a grinding low-level despair, right? A, 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 a kind of grinding despair about, or lack of hope about it all working out right, about how to figure this out in a culture that doesn't help me anymore. And, and I wonder too, with the distance question, you know, we know from research that most Americans, most college students believe in God, but also feel distant from God. And I wonder if that, which of those distances came first, right? Uh, which, is it the, our distance from each other, our distance from God, which, and which direction does that go in? So it's, it's a daunting problem, but I, I am really confident uh, from the responses that I get from college students that they're craving help, they want help, and help, you know, okay. this, is, this is possible. So even with a lot of connections, a lot of friends at this birthday party, not a lot of right. real relationships right. possible. Right. Okay, so Emily, you wrote a book titled The Power of Meaning, it's wonderful. Thank you for writing it. Uh, Finding Fulfillment in a World Obsessed with Happiness. How did your interest in the problem of meaning come about? Um, well, thank you all for being here. It's so wonderful to be with this community and with Marcy and Carrie. Um, so I, you know, this low level kind of despair mm -hmm. that you talk about, that, that phrase really resonated with me. I, I grew up, I think, like a lot of people in a, in a household that was spiritual and religious. My parents were Sufis. Um, Sufism is a mystical branch of Islam. The poet Rumi was a Sufi, whirling dervishes. Um, so we lived, actually, in a Sufi meeting house that my parents administered. So there were Sufis who kind of came to our home twice a week to meditate. And, you know, as a child, it was a very kind of enchanting experience to be in this world of mystical seekers who had 
kind of clear answers to these questions of what is the meaning of life. It's something, you know, you call it God, call it the sacred, the transcendent. Um, and the meaning of life, like leading a meaningful life, was about doing certain things to get closer to that higher reality, whether it was meditating, praying, doing acts of service, practicing loving kindness. Um, so that, that just kind of stayed with me. Eventually, though, you know, as I got older, we moved out of the Sufi Meeting House. And this was in Montreal, by the way. And we, we came to the United States. And without that kind of daily grounding of Sufism, that presence of this higher transcendent thing to strive towards, I began to wonder, well, what is this all about? Like, is it possible to lead a meaningful life without religion, without a outside of a spiritual context? And in college, this led me to study philosophy in graduate school um, to study positive psychology, which is a field of psychology concerned with kind of the ancient philosophical questions of what is a good life, what is virtue, how can we, how can we all be happy, find meaning. Um, and what I kind of discovered, and we were talking about this before this, this panel began, was that there's so much emphasis in our culture on happiness. You know, the whole point of life where kind of we receive these messages is to, you know, be happy, pursue happiness, and that if we do, it will kind of fill us up. Um, but we have all these people, especially young people, who are doing that. They're kind of on this quest, like chasing success, riches, doing what they think they're supposed to do to be happy, and yet there's this rising tide of despair, not just among the young, but, but among everyone. Um, the statistics show that, and we can talk about that if, if you're interested. Um, and in the positive psychology program, I came across this research about meaning, which it, it kind of finally gave me a language to understand why the happiness zeitgeist was not resonating. And it was because, you know, the research showed that what actually brings people this fulfillment and fills this kind of existential vacuum, the void that, you know, we saw that the young woman on the video dealing with um, is meaning. So feeling connected to something beyond yourself, being part of something bigger, feeling like your life matters and is significant. And that really resonated. So I, I just started writing about it. And there was a, a large response kind of like with your dating class. And I think it, it suggests that there's a real hunger for these kinds of this kind of engagement with these questions, and you know, so many of our traditional sources of meaning and venues for discussing meaning are no longer part of people's daily lives, and so they're kind of yearning for for ways to discuss. And I think you know, your, your class, like maybe the things that I'm writing, perhaps kind of gives them that that venue. But that yearning is definitely there. So you're saying some of these. Uh, places where we used to access meaning are no longer there. Can you, can you speak more about that? And, and also, in your book, you write that when people can't answer the why of existence, they can conclude that life is meaningless. Mm -hmm. Can you speak more to that why of existence? Definitely. So you know, it, it's an interesting audience. I, I, I wonder if, if people in this audience feel this way, but I, I think that if you you know, take kind of pluck your like average secular person from a city like New York or a college campus like Boston College. Um, and, you know, you'll find that they, they're probably not, um, you know, religious attendance is declining. So they're probably not going to church or temple or mosque or whatever. Um, the kind of communities that grounded people's lives, um, they're more distant from, they, people leave home to go to college and for work, they rarely, you know, they often do not return. Um, sense of tradition, ritual, the, you know, these things that for thousands of years kind of programmed meaning into our lives and organized our lives are just not really part of kind of the day-to-day -day experience of lived existence. And so um, that's kind of what I'm talking about when I say that these traditional forms of meaning are not there, the absence of community and religion and transcendence and ritual um, that, that kind of, have, you know, pe people are forced to find meaning on their own and that can be a very daunting challenge. Because you have to ask yourself, you know, everyone, Viktor Frankl, the Holocaust survivor, you know, talks about how this yearning that people have for meaning is as important and vital for our psychological and spiritual well-being as food and water are for our physical being. And so without that, you know, people kind of, they give up hope and despair. And without kind of those answers that, are, that, that were kind of given to us, at least to consider as a, as a possibility mm -hmm. through religion, through community and, and, and tradition, um, we're left to find that why on our own. And you know, there's a lot of research and also a lot of philosophy, psychology, people like Frankel, who 
have shown that when you have that why, I mean, Viktor Frankl, he, he wrote Man's Search for Meaning, a beautiful book about his experiences uh, in the concentration camps. And the whole message of that book is that the people who were able to endure this horrendous form of suffering, um, even, he said, the, the ones who are more apt to survive in the general degradation of camp life were the ones who had a why, some reason to go on living. And you find this in, in the modern research on meaning as well, that people who have a sense of meaning in life actually live longer. They're more likely to use kind of preventative health services. They take better care of themselves. And it also seems to suggest that the reason is because when you have that why, you have a reason to kind of move into the, the future and the future feels good. So you want, you want to kind of preserve yourself for it. So meaning affects the way we behave. Yes. Our, our sense of meaning changes our behavior. Um, before expanding on what each of you have said, can you each speak about the root cause that you see for the epidemic of loneliness in our culture? What would you say is the root cause? You wanna go? Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I think that is such a hard question, um, but you know, in, in some of the kind of research that I did for my writing, there's just, you know, over the last kind of 200 years, but I think it's probably even longer than that, there's been a, a gr just a shift in values in Western culture towards individualism, away from community. There's a lot of really interesting studies that look at how language use has changed over time. And, you know, if you look back 200 years ago, there was more um, use of the word we and community and us and concepts associated with community like duty and responsibility and um, giving and you know, that uh, in books and art and newspaper articles, more of these words appeared. Now you have more words like I, me, unique, creative, personal, things that kind of express this kind of focus on the self. And one of the studies that I, that, that kind of really resonated with me that I came across talks about how that change in values overlapped with increasing urbanization and industrialization. And so I think there's this kind of sociological story about how as people move to the cities away from home, focus more on their own careers, that there was this kind of loss of the community spirit. It's such an interesting thing, right? Because I, I, I notice this new, when I come to New York. I'm always so excited, and you know. But and you can yet, yet you can be so anonymous mm -hmm. with so many people right within you know ten feet of you. Yeah. Um, it it is it's a really hard question about the root of loneliness. I mean, I think we all sort of know that. Many of us don't feel lonely when we're alone. So, so what's that? It's a, yeah. it's so much more an existential problem than a than a social problem, in in so many ways. And it's it's hard to get at that with young adults, especially because uh, because our fears about talking about loneliness are are really palpable. Um, and I often say to people, isn't it interesting that all the students I know who are who are trying to, to argue their way into bringing a comfort animal, they all want to bring dogs to campus. And, and when you see a dog or a baby on campus, you go crazy mm -hmm. because you don't get to see dogs and babies on, on a college campus. Yeah. And I say, you know, some people might find comfort from a cat or I know somebody who has a ferret or something. That's weird. <laughs> but like, but in most cases, it's dogs. And guess what? It's because a dog looks at you. Yeah. The dog keeps looking at your face. Wondering why you're not feeding it, and and but <laughs> but but just to have another being looking in your eyes, it's it's very powerful and it's very healing and consoling, and and it just makes me realize that a lot of times, and and I don't mean to you know say we got to get rid of social media because that uh, genie's out of the bottle, whatever, but you know lots of the times I. I, I watch students in the cafeterias or in, you know, sitting, and they, they're looking at their phones, and then they look up, and no one's looking back. Mm, yeah. No one is ever looking you in the eye. And, and when students go on my dating assignments, one of the things they're really nervous about is looking someone in the eye for an hour, yeah. because we don't do it anymore. And I, I think there's a biological and existential issue there. Right, that brings, you need social skills to do that, right? right? And right. 
Uh, one of, I got my nieces and nephews together uh, over Christmas and said, guys, I'm going to ask some questions about dating. What, what are the questions you have? And one of my nephews said, he was telling me, you know, the rules have changed. What are the rules for dating? We don't even know how to, guys don't know how to go about this. We, we sort of get in trouble either way. If we, do we take the lead? We, does that offend? You know, they have no idea what the rules are. And it seems in this culture that dating is a real risk. Would you agree with that? Oh, gosh, yeah, <laughs> oh, absolutely. My, my students just got, my, my uh, first year students just got their dating assignment the other day. They're terrified. <laughs> Immediately my office hours are just packed. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I know they didn't want to talk about uh, Thomas Hobbes the other day, but oh well, they want to talk about dating. They're they're yeah. they're um, they're terrified, and 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 I often say to them, look, it's because you know in in so many parts of our lives, uh, effort correlates to success, but not in this one. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Oh, and, and you have to take a risk, but we're very risk averse because guess what? That's evidence that we're humans, but this is just a world in, in, in you know, consumer capitalist society. Just, we, we just want to push and work hard on our own individual projects and to ask somebody else to see us and ratify us and tell us that we're valuable and that we mean something yeah. is really terrifying. It's really terrifying. And, and so I often say to students, I just want you to go for coffee with them. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want you to find a soulmate necessarily. I mean, that'd be great if you did, but, but could you just ask somebody out for a cup of coffee and say, I just want to get to know you. And most of the students, I have them come back and talk to each other about how hard that was to ask somebody out what happened, what were the funny things that happened, and then they write up a reflection. Almost all of them say, I couldn't believe how much the person was asking me about myself. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think, why does that surprise you? <laughs> that shouldn't be surprising. You're fascinating, you're interesting, and you're great to be around. But even having a few rules um, okay. gives people permission to mm -hmm. take the It's easier to sure. take the risk. Sure. But why would you say they should take the risk? Right. To, oh. so, to the oh. young people out yeah. there, why should they well, take the risk? Well, to pass the class. But, well, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know. Is it, is, it, is it worth taking the risk? Right, because sure. We're, we're more fragile. Sure. And to your nephew's point, the rules are gone. I, one of the things that I realized when I started thinking about this, I had just been reading uh, some, Jared, some of Jared Diamond's work and Jane Jacobs' final book, uh, Dark Age Ahead, which is a great book, on the loss of social script. And that's, that is the case with dating. It's a lost social script. And so nobody knows what the rules are. And so, you know, risk is, is fine if you know what the rules are, right? So when you go hiking or skiing or something, and it gives you one diamond, two diamonds, three diamonds, you know what the risk is. And you sort of are anticipating, okay, I, I, I'm going to have to come up with this, this much of a skill set. This is, you know, am I ready for, you know, a green trail or a black diamond trail? You know, you got to know. And so, because we don't know what dating is about anymore, no, but you can't assess the risk going in. But so what I say is, no, this is just a level one day. This is reconnaissance working on, work only. This is, this is just finding out. This is information gathering. Then they say, OK, all right, maybe I could do this. So if you can kind of make it low stakes and give them rules, by the second semester, I realized I had to give them actual, like, the directions, <laughs> then they could do it. And they could blame me, you know. That's fine, this crazy lady's making me go on a date. You know, that's great. So, so yeah, to take the risk, as long as you know what, what it's gonna cost you personally, right? right. And cost you to not do it, too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, Emily, you wrote about the need we have to live beyond ourselves, mm -hmm. to experience meaning, and that also takes risk. Mm -hmm. right. Can you speak to the risk involved in living a life of meaning? Well, I think, I mean, I'm really resonating with what with what you're saying, Carrie, about, and, and, and this kind of goes back to living beyond because, you know, in my book, I, I write about how for most people, the, the, 
the, the, the central source of meaning in their lives are their, the relationships that, and communities that give them a sense of belonging. So belonging is really important for a meaningful life. And, um, and that's one way that we go beyond, right? It's these encounters that we have with other people or with communities. And the risk is that you know, you, you, you're emotionally exposed, you make yourself vulnerable to other people. And I think, you know, I have a, I have a younger brother in college and I, you know, I, I remember that, that period of my own life well too. And there, you're taught from a young age, if you, you know, especially if you go to a place like Boston College, you live in a city like New York, that you're, you're given the script for how to be successful, how to achieve, um, all this stuff, but you're not given any script for how to love well, how to lead a meaningful life, all these things. And so when, when you kind of reach adulthood and you have to do it, you have to figure out if this is something you want to devote yourself to, um, there are no rules. And you have been so good at succeeding in all the endeavors of your life that you've never really kind of experienced maybe failure. And, and probably your parents haven't let you because you know they're managing your life or whatever. And so <laughs> these are, right, I mean, these are areas of your life where if you, they might be the first times that you've really encountered failure and rejection, and that's that's unbearable for a lot of people. But I do want to say, especially for the young people in the audience, um, vulnerability. It's I, I wrote I wrote an article about this recently, and I'm so drawn to this topic because we're so afraid to kind of like show who we really are to others, whether that's through asking them on a date. And it's really important to know that when you do that, people actually. Like they, they love it, they're really drawn to it. And like the research shows this, your anecdotal experience will show it. And I kind of experimented with that this past year where I just, you know, I had a difficult year. And um, I was vulnerable and shared with my friends and with mentors. And it really, um, I was amazed by the degree to which it brought me closer to a community that I thought was already there, but it kind of deepened those bonds of connection and created belonging and brought meaning to my life at a time where I really kind of felt unmoored. Wow. Uh, one college student uh, told me that the loneliest place on campus, and Carrie, you kind of alluded to this, is the student center. And she said, we only have each other to look at, and so most of us look down. And so this brings us into this proposal, a need for a proposal to look at something together. It's easier to be with other students if we have something to look at together. And um, loneliness is not just overcome by being in the same place. So a common bond, a sense of belonging, the word belonging, can we talk about that a little bit? What would each of you say about this need to belong? So I think, I mean, I think belonging is, is kind of the, the magic that makes relationships worth your while. You know, we, we, we all have a lot of relationships, people that we kind of interact with, people at work, people in our own family. Um, and th that sense of belonging might not act, always be there. Just because you have a relationship with someone doesn't mean that belonging exists. So belonging, as I understand it, um, is being in a relationship where you really feel valued for who you are intrinsically. and where you value other people for who they are intrinsically. And I think that's really important, that kind of intrinsic piece of it, because so many of us are in relationships where you're valued for, for what you do, what you achieve, um, who you hate, you know, gangs, terrorist organizations, um, and not really for who you are. And so there's something about kind of seeing another person's like, and accepting their kind of intrinsic worth, if you're religious, like the, the, their soul, their, their Atman, whatever, and, the, and kind of loving that, that you know, piece of God or the divine in each person. Um, and I think that's, what, that, that's the core of belonging. And when there is that sense of belonging, there's increased meaning. Yes, exactly. No, exactly. I mean, and this is, you know, there's so much research on this, and I'm sure just people's experience can, can, can speak to this as well, that when you feel a sense of belonging, you, there's something about knowing that you matter to others that makes you understand your own life is mattering. And I'll tell you about one psychology study that, that kind of showed this in, in a bit of a cruel way, but um, they, had, they had kind of all these college students come into the lab, and they... Um, they basically told them, they had them mingle with one another, and they told some of them that um, there's gonna be a second so socializing experience, and 
by the way, like everybody wants to, all, all the people that you met want to talk to you again. And then they told the other half that actually none of the people that you met want to talk to you again. Um, <laughs> you were just that awful. But um, the people who were made to feel kind of rejected and ostracized not only rated their own lives as less meaningful, but they rated life in general as less meaningful. So there's this kind of really powerful connection between this kind of existential sense of meaning and feeling like you belong in the world and have value to others. But if you feel you don't belong, mm -hmm. what, what steps can you take to increase an mm -hmm. inner understanding of belonging and experience of belonging? The way, you know, I said earlier that belonging isn't just a feature of a relationship, and, and this is one of the things I learned as I kind of researched my book and spoke to people. It's, it's a choice that you make, and it's something that exists, can exist in moments between people. Um, and, you know, on dates, for example, where there's that alchemy that, that, that happens. Um, and I, I tell a story uh, that a friend of mine told me to kind of illustrate this. So my friend Jonathan, he actually lives, you know, in New York City on the Upper West Side. And every morning he has this routine where he goes and he buys a newspaper from this street vendor um, on the corner near the subway. And, you know, you can imagine it's New York, it's rush hour, it's busy, and these two people have every incentive to kind of rush through this transaction, this exchange of goods and money. Um, but they, they both take a moment to kind of slow down, to talk to each other, to treat each other like human beings. And um, over the years, they've gotten to know one another and ask about one another's children, wish each other happy birthdays. And they leave that encounter kind of feeling elevated. Like, you know, there's, there's, that was a meaningful connection, a moment of grace that lifts them up um, for the rest of the day. Uh, well, one time, Jonathan went to go buy the newspaper, and he realized that he didn't have the right change. And the vendor said, don't worry about it. This time, it's on me. Uh, but Jonathan felt uncomfortable with that. So he went to a store, and he bought something he didn't need to make change. And when he came back, and he gave the money to the vendor, uh, the vendor drew back. He, he was hurt. He had been trying to do something to kind of raise the stakes of intimacy and belonging in their friendship, but Jonathan had re re rejected that, that bid for affection. Um, so I think about that story a lot in the sense of how easy it is to kind of build up that belonging, and also how easy it is to kind of knock it down in ways that, you know, we, we, we probably all do all the time, like checking our phones on a date or at dinner with our husbands. Right. Um, but just, you know, as easy as it is to kind of knock it down, it's also easy to build it up by seeking out and cultivating those moments of connection. And if you do something like what Jonathan did to, to repair that connection through, through an act of vulnerability. So the next time Jonathan saw the vendor, um, he brought him a cup of tea as kind of a way to apologize and, mm -hmm. and restore their connection. And they continue to share that moment each day. So, you know, it's really, it is kind of about kind of putting yourself out there a, a little bit, being a little vulnerable and yeah. finding those connections in, in, in relationships that you have with close ones, but also with people more distant maybe. But you're also saying that nothing is insignificant mm -hmm. in these interactions, little right. interactions, and we can repair them and yeah. be intentional, be intentional about greater belonging in our lives. No, exactly. I was just, I was speaking at a, a high school the other day, and, and the woman who was kind of driving me around um, is on faculty at the high school, and she was telling me how amazing it is to her that years later, um, you know, students will come to her and say, I just wanted to let you know it meant so much to me that day, fall semester, when you just asked me, you know, how did my exam go? Or, you know, when you said, hey, like, you did a really good job in the play. And it really struck her because, you know, to her, she was just being her normal self. And for them, it was somebody who they respected saying, basically, I, I care for you, I see you. And we, you know, she didn't realize that she had that effect. And we probably all have that effect or the other kind of effect, which leaves people feeling a little lesser. Um, and so we have that power to kind of leave that legacy in people. Uh, Carrie, would you say there's a connection between belonging to a community and dating? Oh, goodness. Um, absolutely. Okay, let me hold that because I have something to add yeah. about the the other question about belonging generally, because I was watching your TED Talk the other day, which is fantastic, mm -hmm. you should watch your TED Talk. Um, and I really loved what you said about belonging on the cheap mm. too, that 
that there's, that there's something really powerful about belonging in all of these different, at all of these different sort of levels and niches in our lives. And, and it made me think, as, you were, as I was watching your TED talk, I, I was thinking of um, a Jesuit at BC, Father Paul McNellis, who talks, he, he spent some time in the military and in Vietnam, and he said, he talks a lot when he speaks about friendship, about the type of friendship, you know, so most friendships are, are this, right? But then there's also that friendship that forms sometimes when you have a purpose or a project, and you're both looking at the same goal. You're both working toward the same thing. And, and that can be a wonderful thing, but it can also be belonging on the cheap. Mm -hmm. um, I, I talk to students a lot um, who come back from wonderful service trips or have worked on a service project together, and then they don't know how to develop community that, that really sustains those connections. They don't know how to do it, so they're college students, so what they do is just drink together. <laughs> and that's, and I, I say to them, isn't that strange that you, you went on this amazing service trip, you had these deep connections on questions of faith and justice, and solidarity with the people you were you were with, and then you come back and you can't find you can't figure out how to sustain the community of belonging, because it's hard to turn from that to this, right? It's it's really hard, unless it's like your comfort dog, right? I mean, and so so, I I do think this goes to your next question of yeah, dating. Dating is, is really a risk that feels too risky if you don't have regular experiences of people saying, oh, that's interesting, but you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? A and, and if you feel like, well, it always has to be about something else and never about me, then the step into dating and, and, a, and a romantic relationship feels, feels too, like some other planet. Mm -hmm. Okay, to both of you, uh, taking into account uh, the encounter's title, Something to Start From, what are your final thoughts about where we could start from to address the epic of loneliness and dating? Oh, you know, for me, I, I, was just, I just gave a talk uh, to a group of students just the other day, and I said, you know, for, for making connections, for... for for sort of lifting ourselves together up out of the, this sort of existential loneliness, I think we all need a lot of courage, right? I think one of the things that I have discovered in these years of giving my students dating assignments is that, is that mostly what they're, they're excited about after they've done this assignment is not that they have found somebody to marry or, you know, I mean, that, that happened, but uh, mostly it's not. But mostly what they experience is their own social courage, their own courage to, to sort of ask for what they really want and to ask themselves what they really desire and what they really fear. And I often say to them, it's, it's small acts of courage that we need, right? It's, it's small acts of social courage and paying attention when, when we miss the mark. And, and trying to be courageous about making up for that, bringing the cup of tea. And encourage, I often say to my students, remember what Aristotle, Aristotle says, he spends a lot of time in his ethics telling us what courage is not, because he says most people get it wrong. Courage is not recklessness, it's not running into a burning building. Courage is, is knowing what's worth fearing and what is worth pursuing. And, and make habituating yourself to pursue what's really worth pursuing and to avoid what is really worth fearing and what's soul damaging, right? And so small acts of courage are, are, what I, are, are the something that we can start with, I think. And even with, even with dating, you say not everyone is called to marriage, but everyone is called to relationship. Absolutely. And so taking that step or taking that right. risk Right. launches us into relationship. For sure. Emily? So, um, I, as you, Carrie, you're talking, there's this study that I keep thinking about, I'm sure you're familiar with it, where it's um, 
they, there was a New York Times article written about it that went super viral. Perhaps you all have read it. Um, it's, it was called To Fall in Love with Anyone, Do This. And um, it basically, it, it, the woman who wrote the article went through and did what a study told, research, told uh, college students to do, trying to get the college students to fall in love with one another. And so what the study had people do was um, sit with each other for an hour and ask each other a series of increasingly intimate questions. And at the very end, they're supposed to stare into each other's eyes right. for like a few minutes. So that goes back to your point about eyes. But the questions were, I mean, they were of increasing intimacy. So the first one was like, um, if you could have anyone over to dinner, who would it be? Um, and it, it, it was in three sets. So that was from the first set. From the second set, it was, it, it was questions like, um, you know, tell me about a bad dream that you had, or what, what was your relationship like to your mother and your father? And from the thir final set, the most intimate, it was questions like, um, you know, tell me something about you that nobody knows, um, and tell me something that you're struggling with right now. And I, I remember that these questions, and I, I kind of, my, my husband and I kind of went through and did some of them together, and it really, I think what's so powerful about those questions is that they get you to cut right to what really matters. Um, and have a conversation that's really deep and where you can, where you both feel safe to be vulnerable because like it's in the study setting and you're, you're being told <laughs> that you're supposed to do it. Um, but this idea that like cutting to the conversations, having the conversations that really matter, um, I think that is for so many people that that's such a powerful way to build meaning, these encounters that we have with one another where you, you kind of, you know, it's that like, it's, it's that I, thou kind of thing where like you see the other person as a real kind of embodied three-dimensional being. Um, and so I would suggest having those kinds of conversations by you know, looking at that, looking at those 36 questions, seeing is there a place to kind of get there? Or I have two other examples. There's a wonderful organization called StoryCorps where you go in um, to a booth and you are interviewed by somebody and you know, like a, a daughter will interview a mother or um, uh, you know, two friends will interview each other. And they have these questions where they're asking questions that they wouldn't normally ask one another. So like your daughter might ask you, mom, like how did you know that you first fell in love with? When did you know you were first in love with like my dad? Um, and it produces these beautiful conversation transcripts that kind of deepen the, the friendship. I mean, the, the relationship. You hear people who do who do this, and they say, "Oh my God! Like we've known each other for all these years. How come we haven't talked about this stuff before?" Um, the, and the other example, and so that's StoryCorps. If you just Google the website, they have all kinds of prompts and things like this. And they have an app where you can actually have record a conversation like this with somebody, and it gets and then it gets archived in the Library of Congress, so that so it's always there. This kind of piece of your history. Um, <laughs> is that funny? Is that uncomfortable uh -oh. for people? <laughs> um, the other thing is I, um, and there's so many things like this, I'm just going to tell you one. I, I, I'm involved with this thing um, in DC called the Ben Franklin Circles, and the circles are actually this, um, they were started by the 92nd Street Y here in New York, but there's kind of dozens of them around the country now, and they're basically clubs. And so what we do is we get together, and each meeting we talk about one of Franklin's 13 virtues. He had these 13 virtues that he thought were key to living a good life, like tranquility and humility and um, industriousness, things like this. Um, so the 92nd Street Y, so, you know, just kind of randomly, I was working with them on something else, asked me to start this in DC. And it was a group of strangers that came together at first, and I didn't, I didn't know them at all. And it turns out we were all from different political backgrounds, you know, different religious backgrounds, and I didn't know where to have it, so I just kind of invited them to my house, which I wasn't sure if that was like a dangerous thing to do, but um, anyways, I, you know, we'd, we'd, we started meeting, and this instant kind of community developed, and it was because by virtue of talking about these virtues in our day-to-day -day lives, we were able to like cut out the BS and get to the heart of like what really matters. And so now like we, we have this and it's this beautiful community that I look forward to. I mean, I, I kind of tried to let it die at one point because I was really busy <laughs> and people kept emailing me saying, hey, like when are we gonna next meet? Um, and, so, and so it's just this wonderful thing where, you know, despite all of our differences, we can kind of come together and talk about these values that matter to us, and it's created uh, this beautiful community, so. Right, you have a clear proposal. Yeah. And it mm. decreases the risk. Mm -hmm. So for loneliness, we need 
And to increase meaning, we need belonging, we need to risk, we need to be vulnerable, we need community. Uh, so if we can open it up now for some questions. We have about 13 minutes. So uh, there's a couple hands going up, so. Hi. Um, for many of us, believing what um, is meaningful in our life informs how we date and the relationships we build and maintain. Viktor Frankl went into the concentration camps agnostic, and his belief in meaning and the importance of it came for him to lead him to believe in the God objectively existed, and he became a practicing Christian. And um, so if God exists, that has to be an important part of our meaning and our relationships, and if he doesn't, it would seem that everything is a facade that could easily be shattered. Is there any research that shows that people who are um, practicing Christians or Jews are more or less lonely than others? Mm. Mm. I think, you know, I can't point to like a specific study, um, but I, I do think that the general sense of it is that there are people who are, um, who are religious and, and I think specifically kind of actively religious and so not just, you know, I'm Catholic, but I don't go to church. Um, they, um, they are less lonely because they have this sense of the community that they have like in their religion. And also I think, you know, if they happen to be married or have a family, having that shared um, like value system helps them find more connectedness with one another because you have so many people who are married but feel lonely in their marriage and having this kind of transcendent um, architecture around them I think makes it easier to feel more connected because when kind of the, all the you know things in, in life that that can pull you apart like work or whatever um, start distracting you you can like ground into those values um, and the other thing I think with religion and I was thinking about this when you were talking about the, 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 the therapy dogs and I think another reason why and you mentioned the thing about like people more people believe in God but they feel more distant from God um, I you know I was kind of putting that together and I think part of why people um, why dogs are such a solution is because it's a form of unconditional love. And in religion, at least, you know, I think in Christianity and, and, and Judaism and, um, you know, Islam, there's this idea that, like, God loves you no matter what. And so um, you might have broken up. Your parents might have died in a terrible accident. Like, you might have just left your job. And so all your communities are shattered. But there is still this feeling of, like, I, like, there's something in me that's still valuable and kind of eternally valuable that I think is really I'm reassuring and a bomb against this kind of loneliness that would otherwise come. Hello. Hi, um, <clears throat> Emily, uh, what um, okay. brought this question to my mind is sort of watching you. You look for all the world about 22 years old and you speak like a 75 year old mm -hmm. sage, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which, which to me stimulated the question of age. And sort of at a, on an individual, or I don't know, maybe the fancy words, ontological level, do you see, do we see this, this uh, reticence we have toward this, this kind of relating? Does that change with the individual over age? You know, mm -hmm. it, it's hard to believe, but I've actually been accused of, as I've gotten older, I'm 60, of being more direct than, than I grew up being. Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, that at the individual level, and then sort of ontologically, you know, we have nursing homes full of, you know, lonely elderly people. Are we, is this a, like a, another bulge in the population like the baby boomer where we're setting ourselves up for you know, an even worse collection of lonely people or elderly people in the future? Um, so what, what, you, what you say just makes me think. Um, I, I interviewed um, Camille Paglia recently who's kind of this um, provocateur in academia, and she was, and this is for a piece I'm writing, and she made a really interesting point about like the role of elderly people um, in, in our society, and she says, you know, it used to be like in the agrarian age that as you got older, you had more status in society, especially kind of the, el the elders, you know, the idea that these were people who had kind of wisdom to offer and that they would, you know, live in community with their children and so they would kind of, you know, be taking care of the grandchildren and they had this really valuable role to play. Um, and today, it, it, it's not, you know, like that anymore. Um, and, you, you know, you get older and instead of kind of being, the, you, you become, you turn your kids into like caretakers instead of, you know, it, it, it's just different. Old people, older people feel like they're a burden to others. Um, 
And I think, I just think that's really, that's really sad. I mean, my mom is from Iran and our, my grandmother, her mother, used to live with us for half the year when she, when she was spending more time here in the States. And I, it would always struck me that to my mom and then to her other sisters who also, um, who my grandmother also lived with, they never really thought of themselves as kind of caretakers. They just, you know, their mom was kind of living with them and it was wonderful to kind of have her around. Um, maybe not so much for my dad, but no, I'm just kidding. He, <laughs> he, lo no, he loved her. It was, it was great. No, no. Um, they had a wonderful relationship. But, but yeah, there was not, not this sense of like, oh, this person is an obligation to me. Um, and, and I think that's because Iran, you know, it's, it's, it's not an agrarian society, but it has those kind of traditionalistic norms that, you know, we, that might be helpful for us to think about as we age or as we have parents who age. Hi. Uh, sorry. I don't mean to be, oh, I'll stand up. Um, <laughs> not to be antagonistic or a jerk, but I'm just going to ask the question. Um, I love that opening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to use that. <laughs> help, help me to understand, I mean, really, not to be rude, but like, what is the point of this talk? Because every time I, I hear this sort of messaging, I just think it's a bunch of people in another generation patronizing me, mm. saying that, like, oh, we did it right, you should be doing it better. Like, what am I missing? How do I not think of it in that light? And also, like, what am I doing right? Uh, it just doesn't seem like I'm not, like accompanied by anybody, just like, you should be doing better, and here are the steps to do better. It seems kind of a Band-Aid solution to a, a real problem. Yeah. I, I think part of, uh, you know, I, I often say, when I, when I go to schools, um, to other campuses to talk to students about dating and hookup culture, I, they, the schools will often ask me to speak to faculty uh, and staff, you know, at lunchtime, and then speak to young adults at, in the night, at night because that's when <laughs> they want to talk. And usually I, I say to faculty and staff, look, you know, we've got a lot of young people who, who are with us and we're trying to companion with them on, on journeys of discernment. We often ask them to to do all the integration work of their education, and we don't do any of that. You know, we sit in our academic silos. I, you know, I don't ever talk to anybody who's not in the philosophy department, and I, you know. And, and I, I, to your point, I think you're absolutely right. I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna sound like I'm saying, oh, these young people just haven't figured it out. It is that culturally we've lost a lot of the, the modes of belonging, the modes of community, and the, the script that made it easier to, to work your way through loneliness um, and, and work it out and, and have loneliness be sometimes a facet of your life rather than tipping into really significant depression and anxiety. So I think as a, as a culture, we sort of, this is a cultural project. I, I definitely don't see this as a project that wow, young people did it wrong and, and they just need to figure out how to get out of that. I, I think it's a conversation that, that we all need to have, young and old. I mean, going to the last question, you know, we're all sort of in this together and trying to figure it out. Um, as to the, to the point about Band-Aids, I think, you know, I, I think of what Pope Francis says, you know, well, first you have to, you have to tend to the wounds <laughs> and then, you know, you, it's, it's a battlefield. People are, are wounded, and sometimes Band-Aids are needed. <laughs> but, but you're right, the, this, there's this larger systemic, really complex set of conditions that are, that are leaving a lot of us feeling isolated and alone and existentially uh, fraught and existentially fragile. And in, in a world of so much connectivity that we feel not seen. And, and that isn't, I, 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 I apologize if, if any of us sounded like, you know, we think that's, that's a problem for young people that, that they created. And I, and I always say, look, my college students did not create this problem. They just are sort of trying to find a way through it. And, and my job, and you know, I'm at a Jesuit university, and this is Ignatius's charism, right? To companion with people through that, and so, so I hope that we, that 
I, I apologize if we, if we did sound that way, because I think this is, for all, this is a problem for us all. So this is the beginning of that conversation. Uh, go ahead, Sam. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Oops, I think our, our time is up, actually. <laughs> our time. I know. Oh, my So uh, just thank you so much for coming. This is the beginning of a conversation.